Hi, welcome. Today, I'd like to try to convince everybody to please dream bigger. Uh, big data, it's all around us. It's the future. And you probably have already got all the tools you need to do it. You can do it for free. It does help to spend a little money. And in the future, if you see yourself scaling down a research question or a query because it's just not working because it's too big, please reconsider. Maybe send me an email. I'll help you out. <laughs> So what is big data anyway? Do I, do I really have any? Of course you do. It's all around us in biodiversity informatics. Certainly applies to occurrence data these days. There is a whole bunch of it. It varies a lot. It's not nearly as standardized as we'd probably like to be. Uh, we're making changes to it all the time and we're always making more. Today, we are trying to get to a point of feasibility, not a point of speed. Speed is very expensive. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Big data, do I really need like a super strong big computer? Probably not, does help. Um, the problems you'll encounter generally get solved by a high degree of parallelization. Uh, these systems are generally quite robust. So they'll just split the task up in very many little subtasks. And if one of them fails, they'll just try again. Um, what we really are trying to do is to work with uh, data sets that are bigger than what we can fit in the working memory of our computer. and we don't want to learn lots of new tools and new stuff, and we certainly do not want to maintain a new piece of big data infrastructure. I've done it, it's very tiring. Um, a big data mindset, let's go over some general concepts. Uh, what we want to do is we want to postpone our work as long as possible. We want to convince somebody else to optimize our queries for us. We want to avoid reading all this data because that takes a lot of time. And really, we want to do less work and get more done preferably using somebody else's resources and really should have been storing all this stuff anyway. Uh, let's avoid it if we can. Uh, lazy evaluation. So when queries get really complex, we tend to think eagerly. We split them up in our mind in little subsets and do them one by one. Computers don't have to work this way. They can look at the whole thing and dip, mull it over and then do it in a more optimized fashion. If you write a long query and in the end you just go, oh, and just for Tasmania, you don't need to read all the records in the whole world. You can just read all the Tasmanian ones and that'll save you a lot of time. Um, there's a lot of frameworks that already do this. Some of them you probably use already. Something like Pandas can do it, for example, although not by default. And some tools are specialized to do it this way. Uh, Spark, uh, Apache Arrow, for example. Things like Polar, which is like a, a Pandas-like library for Python. There's also some discussion about using Arrow in the back end of the plier. Very interesting, don't you find? Um, optimization, let's take Spark as an example. Uh, Spark can ingest all sorts of languages as queries. It can do Python, R, Pandas, SQL, Scala, whatever you want, really. Uh, and then it'll abstract that query into something called an abstract syntax tree, which is an interesting concept which we will not further explain, but you can think about it like a sort of natural language representation of your query. So I'll take this abstract query and then optimize it in two ways, logically and physically. Logically means it will think about it, mull it over and do push down filtering is what I just described. Um, Think about it like a big cookbook of all sorts of smart optimization rules, and I'll try to apply them. The really smarter people than us have thought of them. Then the, the physical optimization, it will look at a bunch of ways on how to do it, what kind of filtering and sorting methods to use, develop a cost model for them, pick the cheapest one, really great. And then in the end, it will generate actual code to do it. In the case of Spark, that will be Scala, which means that it doesn't matter what language you actually wrote your query in, SQL, Python, R, all about the same speed because it's just Scala doing the work in the end. Alternatives are available. Uh, partitioning, these files are really big. It's not very practical to put it all in one big CSV, although you can, uh, but you can also partition it. And if you partition it in a way that is convenient for the kind of queries you're doing, like for example, these spots, all little small files that have the country, the text and key and the date and the name. If I'll be filtering on the year or on the country, I don't need to read all these files, saving me a whole bunch of memory and time. Uh, libraries like Arrow are actually built to do this. Then using somebody else's computer. Of course, you can do this locally, and that's actually how I do it, but it's uh, one of the most common questions you get, like, oh, I don't have a powerful machine, can I still do it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. The developers of 
Spark, they've now handed it over to Apache. They have a company called Databricks and they'll sell you notebooks that are really very user-friendly. You have support lots of languages and uh, everything is done for you. You don't need to negotiate with uh, the big fellas like AWS or Microsoft Azure. They'll do all that for you. You can schedule jobs if, if you've got this huge query that you want to do every month or every hour. It's expensive then uh, you can. They also got a community edition, which is free. So you'll get one machine with two cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM for all eternity. It's great. There's the Galaxy project, which will give you a much more powerful machine, but it's a bit less user friendly. And you can also do it on like Google Colab or something, although you'll probably time out. But if you wiggle your mouse often enough, uh, it'll work. You can also use free trials. So if you just have one question and you just want to try it out, you can use that. But of course, you'll eventually have to pay. Um, again, in big data, you either really need patience or money. I don't really have either. <laughs> uh, so should I store my data set locally? Well, it really depends. Uh, I don't really have all that much space on my computer, but I'm not really very patient. So well, with this partitioning that uh, infrastructures like GBIF actually use, I could load the data set over the internet, but I just store it on a hard drive. Um, all occurrences in GBIF is about 204 gigabytes compressed. The backbone is two gigabytes uncompressed, way faster to use that locally as the API. Uh, but you can totally read it from the internet because you don't actually download all 204 gigabytes, just what you're using. So if you're a patient, there's zero setup time. It's, uh, it's a good option. So let's go through this uh, in an example. Uh, I like iNaturalist a lot. <laughs> so. When I go on holiday, I'm often left wondering what is the rarest thing that I saw. So we can actually figure that out. So where, what did I see? What taxon that has the least occurrences on GBIF? Where is my contribution relatively the biggest? So how are we going to go about this? We're going to read all GBIF occurrences. Uh, I'm going to list what observations I saw. I'm going to count how often these species were seen on GBIF. I'm going to merge those tables, take the least often stuff. That's the rarest. That's what I want to know. There's code coming up. Uh, Brace yourself. <laughs> so the top part is just trying to get out what's mine. Then the middle part is what was seen before and how often. That's the counting bit. And then at the bottom, I'm merging those and seeing what I observed. The first and the last line are just getting it in and out of Spark. You'll notice this is not, uh, this is just a flyer, really. So this is stuff at least some of us in this room can write. And it'll work just the same whatever language you want. But now that I've done this, you're probably wondering, I could do that locally. That, that doesn't sound difficult. This takes around six minutes to run. I could probably do that faster. You're probably right. Uh, but uh, what if I want to do that for all countries I've ever been in? So uh, it doesn't really get much more complicated. Uh, all I'm changing really is what columns I'm extracting and what I'm grouping on. Not very difficult. Um, the join is slightly different. Uh, this takes around six minutes to run. So equal time. Let's speed up a little bit. So. What if I want to do that for everyone? Actually, it becomes a bit, bit more shorter, a bit easier, because I don't need to do all that filtering anymore. Uh, just group on the right solder in the end. This takes around six minutes to run, so there's no penalty for scaling up that big. So what about the audience, really? I've uh, gone through the liberty of calculating for everybody on iNaturalist, so I thought I'd share. But because I'd like to promote the use of ORCIDs, I've only actually published <laughs> the pages of people with an ORCID. So if you're curious, you can go to this page on GitHub, and you'll stick your ORCID at the end. And if you don't enter an ORCID, you'll get a big table. You'll have to look for yourself. And then you can actually figure out what is the rarest thing that you ever saw. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks very much, P uh, Peter. Uh, can we see if there's any questions online? No, not yet. Thank you. That was quite fascinating. Oh, David Fichtmüller from the Botanic Garden Botanical Museum in Berlin here. Um, I really like your approach. It's kind of similar how I work and think and just would like to add the list at the beginning, the typical uh, uh, thoughts that go into handling big data. I, I think you missed the last one, writing the documentation about it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, that's fair, yeah. <laughs> Arthur. Is this on? Yes. Um, Arthur Chapman. 
Uh, back about 33 years ago, I was funding the databasing of some of Australia's museums and herbaria. And somebody came to me and said, we can't database this, it's just too much data. And I said, well, we're downloading the NDVI satellite data every day for Australia. And one day's coverage is more data than all the museums and herbaria in Australia put together. So I'm pleased to see your talk pushing this this idea. Thank you. Yeah, it's an important note that the, the, the tools that I'm mentioning here scale way beyond what we're actually doing. So we are talking here about an under one terabyte scale, but things like Spark will gladly scale into thousands of terabytes. Although probably not on, a, on my laptop. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. An online question. I'm impressed by those uh, example GBIF queries, but do they have much impact upon the GBIF servers? So what actually is happening here is uh, I'm working off a local copy. So GBIF publishes a local snapshot of their uh, occurrence QR every month. So I'll just download that once and they won't even notice because it's hosted on AWS S3. And if I were to use Arrow and Stream at all, I'm not patient enough, my internet is not fast enough, but I could, then I'm still only actually hitting AWS S3. Uh, you could do exactly the same using the GBIF API, and that's actually what I did last year. And that'll result in hundreds of thousands of, of API queries, and they will survive, but they will notice you in your yearly statistics. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. No more questions. Then thanks very much, Peter. And you can go first in the queue for morning tea. <laughs>